Hello everyone, I am Dweller Dude. Welcome back. And today we are doing our eighth 2021 hurricane season forecast and discussion just to get a another look and um, another update on what's going on out there in the northern Atlantic Ocean. Before we get started with the video though, be sure to like and subscribe because 80% of you guys watching are not subscribed and it only takes a couple seconds and it would mean a lot. And we're going to get straight into our 8th 2021 hurricane season forecast and discussion. But just to review what 2021 has been like so far, we had Anna back in May and we have Bill back in, or I think, I think it was like early June. Uh, we had Claudette, which was just after that. And then we had Danny. Uh, both all these were tropical storms until Elsa came along and became our first hurricane and earliest um, fifth name storm ever. And then strengthened as Claudette did off the mid-Atlantic coast. Because as, as you can see, Claudette was a depression until it became a storm once again off the mid-Atlantic coastline. All right, so moving on to our sea surface temperature anomalies in that Nino 3-4 region, which definitely determines what we could have. July, as you can see, which is right now, we're pretty much even. Negative 0.4 for September, negative 0.7 for our or excuse me, for September, and negative 0.7 for November. So that definitely indicates maybe we're heading back to a La Nina later on this hurricane season, which of course will really make a hurricane activity worse. You can see by spaghetti models here and the green line, which is the sum or the average, I should say, of these models. And you can see September through December, we're definitely in that La Nina um, zone. Now, there are plenty of models that keep us in a neutral phase. That's definitely possible. There's also a couple models that... Plunges deep into La Nina. I've never seen a La Nina uh, negative three plus before. That's uh, that's interesting. But hey, you can't really roll out anything because anything's pretty much possible, right? This is, I mean, I'm not saying it's hard to predict, but there's really no like pattern um, for what is happening here. So La Nina, uh, we could we could be back for La Nina, back to a neutral, but we can tell we can base off this guidance what we could expect. Um, look at the southern oscillation here. Our latest 30 day value is nine. Above 8 is La Nina, and below negative 8 is usually usually representing El Nino. So uh, maybe back in 2019, we had some values indicating possible El Nino conditions. And of course, 2021, here we are in some possible La Nina conditions or neutral conditions because of those higher uh, southern oscillation values. So here um, are some, here are some more sea surface temperature anomaly maps, and you can see back in like November, December, like we were definitely down there and, and like way into a La Nina. We've kind of come back up since, so we're pretty much like a neutral phase. The Nino 3-4 is the one you want to look at, by the way. All right. So, again, looking at that negative 0.1, that pretty much represents neutral. So, Nino 1-2 region, which is this one right here, um, is usually near the coast of South America. All of these are along the equator, by the way. Um, actually, Nino 1-2 region is actually just south of the equator. It's, it's the equator and points south in that box. Then we have Nino 3, which is this red region along the equator, the Nino 4 region is this yellow region along the equator. So you have a red box or red rectangle and a yellow one. And then Nino 3, 4 is just like the sum, all right, the pretty much the middle of those. So basically how I like to remember where Nino 3, 4 is, just basically go due south of Hawaii, Hawaii there, and then along the equator is pretty much where that region is. That's how I like to rem remember it. All right, so looking at our sea surface temperatures anomalies here. So you can see 4, 20, 21, all the way through, we got May's data in. Um, I don't think in the last video, I don't think we had May's data in yet. We'll probably get June's data in probably either end of this month or early um, next month. Uh, but all these values are blue. That does indicate La Nina, definitely for sure, because we've also been in there for several months in those blue, um, in those favorable sea surface temperature anomalies for La Nina. We've definitely been in there for a few months. So we're coming out of La Nina now. Obviously, that was as of May. So we're pretty much coming back to a neutral phase um, as of now. Um, ENSO Outlook, we should be getting a new one or a new update to this pretty soon. But as you can see, neutral probably will be dominating, maybe a better chance of it through September, according to this at least. October, October, November becomes kind of a toss up. Maybe December to some better chance, a better than 50% chance of the La Nina. Then it could go back to neutral for next winter or the at least the second half of the winter. So this is definitely going to be interesting. But according to the text here, it does say chances of La Nina increasing into the fall and winter of 21 to 22. But notice what is not increasing is El Nino. Poor El Nino, man. When's the last time we had El Nino? Maybe 19? It's been a little while for you, El Nino. All right, so looking at some of the models here, um, you can see pretty much kept, according to these sets of models, actually most of these sets of model predictions actually keep us in a, because as you can see, let me draw this line here. 
uh, this below this line is La Nina or La Nina conditions. And you can see, look at most models, kind of keep it above that, all right? And even the ones that do dip below that line, they don't really stay there for a long enough amount of time to consider it a La Nina because it does have to stay there for a little while. It can't just dip down for a, a week or so and say, oh, we have a La Nina. It doesn't work like that. So most models keep us right in the neutral criteria. Neutral criteria, I'll draw the line again here, is between negative 0.5 and 0.5. So in between those two black lines there. So most uh, model predictions, including the Euro, um, do kind of keep us uh, in that zone. All right, so here are some CFS uh, forecasts. We're gonna also be showing the CFS model later on in the video for another map. Um, now these sets of models, all right, so again, this between here and here is our, our ENSO neutral. So let me just draw these out real quick for you guys. All right, so there is there is your neutral line. Now, most of these models keep us in a La Nina and for a few months. So the CFS models are definitely hinting more at a La Nina. But notice, uh, almost kind of like a U, it brings it back up, maybe in time for the winter. All right, um, now this particular forecast keeps us a lot in La Nina for the winter, but maybe potentially coming back out of it. And there are a couple of models, a couple outliers, nothing wrong being an outlier. There are a couple that potentially keep us in a, in a neutral phase, but... As you can see by the map story here, uh, the La Nina could increase. These are the CFS model forecasts. These maps over here are, are I think they're made from this black line because the black line is the mean, as you can see the mean here, of all those uh, spaghetti models, all right? And the map represents that black line. So you can see La Nina continuing to build even through February, all right? So looking at the July time frame, and by the way, I did make a fall discussion if you guys want to go look at that as well. I did like a little uh, discussion for the fall um, I'm sure you've already seen it on the top right of your screen um, in the video cards. But look, moving on here to July, and this is basically, again, another way of telling us the Nino 3-4. And also, there's, there's other maps. Not just It's not just about the Nino 3-4 because we have to look at it more detailed as well. Pretty much in neutral through July, August. September gets interesting because maybe, as you saw in my fall discussion video, if you saw it, um, the Borough Meteorology and the NOAA models kind of call for a La Nina. And you can see all the models make their way towards the left as we as the months progress. And of course, November, as you guys know, is the last month of hurricane season. All right, so look at the latest sea surface temperature anomalies here. All right, and as you can see, there are definitely some parts of the Atlantic that are still above average, and there's some parts that have changed a little bit. But one thing that has noticeably changed from my last hurricane discussion video, if you guys saw that. There was a bunch of gray around the Nino 3-4 region, which is basically, I would say, like right about here. All right, so I'll go ahead and circle. So right about here is your Nino 3-4 region. Now, last time we looked at this, there was a bunch of grays and a couple little spots of orange, and okay, maybe a bit above average. But now we're starting to see some blues fill in again, mixed with oranges. So that definitely gives me a feeling that we're still stuck in a neutral phase here. Also, keep an eye out for this for the winter time. If we keep Continue to see that build up there. The jet stream could get um, pushed up and then down. Jet stream could come down over the east as a classic wintertime setup, but that'll be for uh, discuss for another video. Eastern Pacific off the coast of Mexico, remaining above average, but look just not too far away is those really those deeply cold waters, and that sort of protects Hawaii for right now, because as you guys know, usually activity in the Pacific forms and can sometimes go towards Hawaii. Maybe it forms over here. Sometimes it forms in the Eastern Pacific and goes towards Hawaii. Sometimes it goes near the Baja up the Mexican coast, or I can go out and come back in again. So that's how the Pacific works. So Hawaii, hopefully, with this like this barricade of, of colder than average waters, um, that's not to say a system can't make it through there, but it could protect you guys for a little bit. Now, zooming in on the Caribbean, or actually, first of all, let's actually go into the Atlantic here. So you can see this is where Elsa had first tracked through. It's still above average as is the subtropical Atlantic up there. Um, Eastern Gulf is still a little bit below average, but it has gotten better. I'll show you that in just a little bit. Um, of course, because we had Claudette go through there and Elsa, and that, you know, behind it gets a little cooler. Um, also, Elsa went through the Caribbean, so it's fallen back to average, but there are some parts of the Caribbean, including the east and west part, that are still above average in terms of sea surface temperatures, uh, and there you can see it. So closer to the Mexico, Central America area, and then also the Eastern Caribbean, still above average slightly. The Bay of Campeche in the southwestern Gulf is still above average, but the northern Gulf Coast and the eastern Gulf is below average, with the exception of the Gulf Stream, which is right in that hook area right there. All right. Now that is that has been trending upward a little bit, and also the 
Western Atlantic is pretty much average. Of course, there's nothing wrong with, with average, right? So in the tropical Atlantic, these are the sea surface temperature trends, not the anomaly trends, but how the ocean temperatures themselves have trended over the past seven days. Uh, they've been increasing definitely across the um, tropical Atlantic. They, there have been some spots where it's increased a little bit. Uh, Caribbean, of course, has gone down because of that's where Elsa was. Um, off the coast of west coast of Mexico, near the Baja, they actually have gone up as this region right here. So even though the sea surface temperatures are still below average, they have trended up a little bit uh, east of Hawaii. Also, the subtropical Atlantic has increased, and in some areas, like in the far north, much as 2 to 3 degrees Celsius a week that it has been increased, or in the past week. Um, and then in the eastern Gulf, which we are going to zoom in right now, as you can see, still below average, but we have trended up maybe between a half a degree to as much as one and a half degrees over this past week. Right? And then the uh, Caribbean uh, below average, uh, excuse me, they've trended down, I should say. Not, they're not below average. And then around Cuba and the Straits of Florida and the Florida Keys around there trended down a little bit over the past seven days. Now, one reason why we've seen a little quiet down in activity, uh, you probably see it by now, it's just this massive, just massive wave of dust that just come off the coast of Africa and just pretty much dipped down to about the 10 degree north line. So even if storms go south of that 10 degree north line, they can't really avoid the dry air because sometimes storms can go south and then avoid it, but not really. Because it's plunging, the dust is definitely plunging down. So this should put a damper to our activity for a little bit, which is why the title of this video is What's Next? Because of course we want to know what's next. Um, any activity that probably, that could form would probably be either in the Gulf, the Caribbean, or the East Coast, which is probably closer to home, because that's where we have less dry air. Um, we're gonna be looking at wind shear maps as well. Now also, well, due to that dry air, and even not just in tropical Atlantic, but also in the West, Western Atlantic, farther west, right? Definitely some uh, lower convection according to the GEFS ensembles, all right? This is uh, from the 11th to the 18th um, of July. So now through the next week. And even the 20th through the 27th, I mean, the activity, the convection looks a lot lower. While in Asia or eastern parts of Asia or in the in the western Pacific, the convection is going up. As you can see, Africa is also here and then in here as well. This is the way the map is made. So even over Africa, convection seems to be a lot lower. So that might even worsen their, some parts of the area that have drought in Africa. It could worsen it a little bit. All right, now looking at the CFS model, doesn't look as extreme. Um, as you can see, over the middle of Africa, according to this, to the 25th of July to the 1st of August, so we're going a bit farther out now, um, some increased convection over Africa, but maybe not quite so much over the Atlantic. Now, that doesn't mean that if convection were to form here in Africa, over here, that it can't track into this region, and a system could still develop. This is just saying the convection in terms of a newly forming system, like a system maybe wouldn't form in this area. That's not to say a system can't track through it, all right? Because that depends on the environmental conditions, which we're also going to keep continuing to look at, if that makes sense. Um, tropical cyclone heat potential. Um, sea surface temperatures matter, so do the subsurface temperatures and how the heat is, right? That matters. And the Northern Caribbean, we still have a lot of that. That's going to continue to spread north. We're seeing going up the Gulf Stream into the Gulf of Mexico over the past month or so. Again, we still have, if you look, we still have, in terms of, obviously not in terms of like the dates, because we've already been through like a month, what, like, almost a month and a half of hurricane season. But in terms of activity and climatological data, we have about 95% or 96% of our activity still left to go. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but Caribbean definitely still have a decent amount of tropical cyclonic heat. Um, a couple wind shear maps. This one, I like it because it almost works like a traffic light. Green is good, yellow is eh, okay, and red is kind of bad. Um, and in terms of this, there are some areas in those yellow and greens where it's like okay for development, like in the northeastern Gulf, um, east of the Bahamas here. But most, mostly we're pretty much in the red, which is um, actually a good thing in this case because more wind shear would limit tropical development. Uh, here's another map of looking at it. It's pretty much the same thing, right? East of the Bahamas, we have a little area where shear has actually plummeted 10, 20 knots in the past 24 hours. Um, central eastern Gulf, also looking pretty low. Um, also, if, if you look at this map, um, there's some, been some green out there in the tropical Atlantic, so wind shear is actually pretty low out there. The problem is, um, is the dry air, obviously. And, but the Caribbean has some pretty high shear right now, so 
I think we're good to go into Caribbean in terms of tropical activity there uh, for the near foreseeable future. Uh, Caribbean shear here. Um, so as you can see here, we have some pretty much average shear. It was below average for a while. Again, that black line is like our average line, if you will. Uh, we kind of gone back up again. This goes up and down, but as long, I mean, you can see mostly, especially uh, recently here, we've stayed near that um, black line, which is like average shear. Now, the chocolate lake, like I just told you earlier, there's a lot of greens, right? Well, we've been below average for a while now. Probably, I would even say since the middle, late June time frame, we have been below average in terms of our shear, our vertical shear in the tropical Atlantic. And the lowest points are usually middle of July and middle of September, where the shear by climatological standards can get pretty low. But even so, usually between July and October, uh, we do see shear at its lowest point, which is why we start to see activity forming this way between July and October. We're going to get into some of the forecasts now because CSU has updated their forecast. They've gone up again to 20 named storms, 9 hurricanes, and 4 major hurricanes. Uh, while the average, of course, as you know, 1473 has gone up due to the new um, averages coming in, right? We, we were so used to the 1981, at least that's what I grew up with, 1981 to 2010 average. Probably in 2031, we're going to have a 2001 to 2030 average come in, and the data will be adjusted based off of that. Nova's forecast is 13 to 20 named storms, 6 to 10 hurricanes, and 3 to 5 major hurricanes, um, which is pretty much, I mean, in terms of named storms, that's above average, but the hurricanes and the major hurricanes pretty much seems on par, or maybe just a touch above average. All right, so again, our averages have changed between 12 to 14, or excuse me, we went from 12 to 14 named storms, hurricanes by average increased by one, and major hurricanes has stayed the same, actually. All right, so... Um, this should be a number eight, by the way. Sorry about that, number eight. So our, I did update this, of course, to what CSU updated their forecast with. 20 named storms, nine hurricanes, four major hurricanes. Um, we have the uh, weather company. Actually, um, they raised their named storm by one. So 19 uh, named storms, eight hurricanes, and four major hurricanes. Actually, whether we haven't seen any updates come in from them yet. Still 16 to 20 named storms, seven to 10 hurricanes, and three to five majors. Honestly, I have no reason to change my uh, forecast either, right? Especially, um, there's a lot of uh, agreement here between uh, me and AccuWeather and Colorado State University and the Weather Channel. Even NOAA was pretty close to this as well. 16 to 21 named storms, 8 to 10 hurricanes, and 2 to 4 majors is my call as of right now. And so far, we've had 5 named storms. So uh, I'll put so far over here. We have 5 named storms, 1 hurricane, and 0 major hurricanes. And remember... And now this is why I feel like you might be wondering, well, why is the named storm number so high and the hurricane and major hurricane numbers are pretty low, right? Of course, we usually, like, you, you can't see more hurricanes than named storms because uh, a hurricane has to be a named storm first. So that number will never be lower. It can only be the same or less. Um, but the, I feel like conditions in the Atlantic right now are favorable to form. Like, as you saw, our first four named storms were all just named storms. It took Elsa to be a hurricane. Um, I feel like conditions are conducive to form a lot of tropical storms, but not so conducive to strengthen them in hurricanes or major hurricanes. That's just my point of view right now. This could still change. We have months of our hurricane season left to go, several months, in fact. So as we stand so far, five named storms, one hurricane, and zero majors. So definitely we're chugging along. In terms of named storms, we're beating 2020. And if that was a record season, that's sort of a bad sign. So thank you guys for watching today's video. Stay tuned for more updates. I am the Weather Dude. Signing off till next time. I will catch you guys in the next video.